double 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 p podcast double p what i like to call double 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 double, double p what i like to call double double double, double p podcast Welcome to the Double P Podcast Network. My name's Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F I T T E N T R I M at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And across from me tonight is the Leprechaun to my angry Mister Tuesday. It's Catfish. Catfish, how you doing? Oh, I'm so glad to be back. You back. know. Like one of the old gods, I feel like I've been forgotten on the Double P Podcast. What do you mean? You were the star of one of our most downloaded shows by Oz fans, our Hate Watch Emerald City Podcast. <laughs> so, Catfish, how can people find you on Twitter? They can hit me up at CJGman67. Catfish, this is part of the Double P Podcast family. You can check out all our podcasts and learn about them on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash double P podcast. That's the word double, the single letter P, the word podcasts, plural, podcasts, plural, facebook.com slash double P podcast. Yeah, you know what? I, I feel like uh, our summer, summer, the double P podcast network summer is coming to a close. There is going to be coming up is going to be some amazing podcasts. You've got your Twin Peaks podcast. It's called Twin Peaks, the gifted and the damn. That's true. <laughs> right. Plus, and then we're going summer's to have... coming to a close because Game of Thrones is back in July. Absolutely. And then shortly and non after that should be the last and final season of The Strain. Stergoy. And then after that, we've got the Ash podcast. Let me tell you something. I hope you are well rested out there, listeners, because tonight, tonight, we have something special for you. That's right, Catfish. We have just, just not even 12 minutes ago, we were in the Television Academy building here in North Hollywood. It's the organization which handles the Emmy Awards. There was a special event there tonight. Why don't you tell our double L's? Double L's? That's what I like to call our loyal listeners. Why don't you tell <sighs> them about it? I haven't it? been on here for so long. All right. Well, uh, what happens is... Around Emmy season, when the nominations come out, all these shows put on events. Now, even though it's the show putting on the events and not the Television Academy, it's only offered to Television Academy members, which I luckily happen to be one. And so this is the season for going and seeing either the first episode of a new season, the final episode of last season. And then there's a nice panel discussion uh, with the actors and the creators. And then usually there's some nice uh, free food and drink. So it's a very lovely season. It's not a season to be losing weight. Because <laughs> they're, they're giving away a lot of goodies. A lot of goodies. And tonight, tonight was to for it. American Gods. So we got to see the pilot episode of American Gods two days earlier. And then a discussion afterwards, which had uh, about six cast members. It had the two creators in it. Now, sadly, Ian McShane was supposed to be there, but One apparently of the main he stars had of food the new poisoning. Show? Uh-huh. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about the pilot and also some interesting tidbits that we heard from the post discussion that only those wink, wink in the know will know. Right. They, in that post pilot screening discussion, they actually screened it. Scenes from future episodes, so we saw we saw a lot. We did see a lot of good things, and uh, this was it was mostly we'll have to say they showed us the pilot episode, and then they had some characters, some actors who portrayed characters that weren't in the pilot episode. So before they asked them a question, they showed them pretty much they showed how the scene where the character is introduced. I just want to tell you listeners right up at the top that the first part of this podcast we're going to try try to stay as spoiler-free as possible. Oof. But then, after we do a lengthy discussion about this premiere episode and the great event we saw with the actors at the Television Academy, then we're going to jump to a spoiler-filled section where we are going to spoil what we found out about upcoming episodes, and that includes some spoilers that book readers may not know. So we'll give you a chance to jump out, but if you want to know some juicy details from the cast, from the producers, and from actual upcoming scenes we saw stay to all the way until the end of the podcast oh yeah and thank bubba for editing all this oh boy it's going to be a big editing project you're listening to right now all right so before we even get into Mm -hmm. our discussion about american gods the season premiere the series premiere i think our listeners need to know our backstories with the neil gaiman book that this television show is based on and let me just say I know nothing. I have not read the American Gods novel. I 
in full disclosure, I'm not really a huge Neil Gaiman fan. And so this was is my introduction to some of his stuff. And I came in completely new. How about you, Catfish? Well, I have read every single thing that has been collected in book form by Neil Gaiman. Whoa. Most of his short stories have been oh my collected God. in book form. Yeah. Uh, I've read uh, Neil Gaiman uh, comics. Comics. So I've read uh, all of the things that Neil Gaiman has done. I love his work. Okay. He is awesome. Sure. Uh, so that's that's my experience with this. Now, this the book that it's based on, which is also American God, called American Gods, is a book that came out uh, 16 years ago. <laughs> Uh, Man, I was I was I was you know babe in the woods then. It's part like, of the millennial generation. It, you were it's like tough to three. think back that far. Yeah. So most of our listeners, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably are more aware of American Gods than Bubba is. But just to sort of set the baseline for what the story is about is that there are old gods that exist in the world, basically who survive and thrive due to uh, the the worship. That people give them. True. Now it's not. It, it, it's not. And again, it's been a while since I read the book, but it's not clear to me whether these gods are actually created by people's belief in them, or but but it's very clear that if belief wanes, the gods weaken, and so the old gods are in a bit of a tough scrape now because pe- less people believe in them, and now we have these new. Modern gods, we have media gods, we have gods that are associated with technology that we have today. So this is sort of a war. It's kind of like the new gods are looking to extinguish the old gods who are barely hanging on by their fingertips. So that's the essential thrust of the story. Catfish, let me just jump in right now. Do it. And say that the way you just described it is more than this pilot episode gives most people. If you're coming in completely cold, you can maybe begin to find out some of that stuff. But if they're coming in cold, they do not hold your hand. They don't, which I think is cool. And I had asked you whether you found the pilot to be confusing. Myself, having familiarity with the book, I didn't think it was confusing. I thought they made a very clear explanation of that theme with the appearance of Belquis. Her first scene sort of lays out that situation, you know, in particular, you could you could see what's happening in particular and not quite get it. But if you sort of get the general idea, Belquis's first scene shows, okay, that gods the old gods are refreshed by someone's belief and faith and worship of them gotcha all right so let's get to it this is the pilot episode let's hear your ranking out of 10 what are you going to give american gods episode one from stars okay i'm going to give it i'm going to give it Nine, what I like to call double c's double c's yeah christ on a cross oh is a letter that is in Christ on a cross. And so it's not a C-O-C, it's a double C. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Christ, the, the, the small words don't count. Oh, I, I'll let of, the, and, or. Con- exactly. I'll let conjunction Genitals junction matter. know that you don't care about it. <laughs> okay. So, so that's a great high rating. I will, there, I did have some issues with it, but let me get to your rating and then we can talk in, in general. I, I don't know how much we're actually going to, since we didn't get a chance to kind of make notes, et cetera, we're just going to give general impressions and, and kind of tidbits of information without doing our standard, like, full breakdown of it. Sure. But before we get into why I gave it nine double Cs. Don't you mean COCs? <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be, if you want to use them all, it's a COAC. Oh, okay. You forgot the uh. As it's did double you. C's, Christ on a cross. What did, what did you, how did you rate this pilot? Well, as the Neil Gaiman agnostic, Newbie. as the American Gods non-book reader, I'm going to give this episode eight of what I like to call double V's. Double V's? Well, double V's is something, you know, I'm out here in Hollywood catfish, and double V is a oh, phrase. I didn't realize that. Double V is a phrase uh, we Hollywood types like to use when we talk about vagina vanishings. Uh-huh. And so eight... Out of 10, Vagina Vanishings, it was good because I read some reviews. Let's be completely honest. Because I read 
other media critics' reviews of American Gods ahead of time. They kind of set up the story just as you just did. And so I was able to just roll with it. I do have some serious issues that in some ways maybe the idea was put in my head by other television critics. But let me say, if they had gone into the second episode and and said, okay, that's the pilot, let's look at the second, I would be like, let's go. I have a feeling if they had shown us the second based on some of the scenes we saw from the second episode in the panel discussion after the premiere, I would have been like, okay, let's go straight to the third. Let me say something. They were agitating tonight to get nominated for Emmys. I believe they are out of the uh, window to be nominated this season. But if they truly are trying to get nominations this season, that means I would be able to go online. Online. They put most of the – I still get a crud load of DVDs, Mm -hmm. but now they put everything online too. If they're really trying to get Emmys this season and I could go online and watch the rest of the episodes, I would do that as soon as humanly possible. That's how interested I am in this because I felt that it was very sure-footed. I felt like they knew what they wanted to do and I felt like I was in good hands. The main problem I had with it was – The reason why they didn't get 10 out of 10, the reason why I got 9 out of 10. Yes, was that – They are in love with the longest of long scenes. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned this. They love long scenes. And to me, the two long scenes, I loved the scenes. And then I got to a point where it felt like it kind of ran out of energy. And I wanted the scene to be over and move on to the next. Catfish, I completely agree with this point. And... uh, I felt that way, too. And it wasn't even that the scene was bad, but it was kind of like, okay, we get it. And uh, there were times that my mind wandered because of those what you would call long scenes as well. And it's not, as I mentioned on our Twin Peaks podcast, Twin Peaks, The Gifted and the Damned, it's not because the visual rhythm is slow and that allows your mind to wander. It's just because... Okay, we get the point. We get the point. Why are we staying here so much almost? And and once again, not that it's bad, but you almost get uncomfortable staying in some of these scenes so long. It's a little bit. Yeah, the two scenes that I'm thinking of are the scene in the bar, which is punctuated with a fight. But by the time it got there, I felt like, gosh, it at least splits us up into two different scenes. I just need to go yeah. somewhere else for a while. It almost feels like it could have been cut into two scenes. But let's go through the whole thing. What, what was the other scene? But we'll, we'll the, break down the sh- the show bits by bit but what was the other long scene that really hit you the other long scene and and again what's weird is i felt like i couldn't take get my finger on whether i loved the performance in the scene or did not love the performance in the scene wow i think the actress is really good and we saw another scene of her i'm talking about shadow moon's best friend's wife if you know the book you've or you've seen the show we know that shadow moon's wife and his best friend died together in a car accident while Shadow Moon's wife was filleting his best friend. Yeah, they were betrayed. They so were, this, this woman's husband betrayed her with her best friend. Yeah. Ouch. So, and, that, and that's true to the novel? That's exactly that, what went down? That is, Whoa. that is exactly the way that it went down in the novel. So as it, as it started to come up, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is what we're going to get. The, the scene between Shadow Moon and his best best friend's widow – Again, the whole time I'm watching the scene... Boy, you love the word again. (laughs) Yes, I do. So I'll say it again. Again, again, I was bothered by her acting in that scene, but that scene went on too long as well. let me say, we saw this in an an auditorium, in a theater crowded with people, and they did like her because she brought a new energy. She brought a lot of comedy. I think the audience is going to come with me. Are on they? the 8 out of 10, because I will provide answers from a newbie's perspective, and when I don't know things, they'll say, oh, well, okay, he didn't read the book, he's brand new to this. Of course, it's cool that he has struggles with answers. I gave this an 8 out of 10. Right. Christ on a cross. And it's not, <laughs> And it, the long scenes you mentioned about definitely were part of my kind of waning at times, even though this was really entertaining, really right. good. Right, it feels very self-assured, don't, don't you agree? Oh, yes. They, they yes. know exactly what they're doing. I love, love, love Brian Fuller's work. Uh, Have you not really- liked any of his work? He did Pushing Daisies, Pushing Daisies, which was so whimsical and fun. He did the NBC reimagining of Hannibal, which was so artistic and lovely. 
and now he's doing this. I, I mean, he right. It was. It's so he has such a very unique vision, and it almost. I mean, here it makes sense on stars, but there were times when I was watching Hannibal, and I thought to myself, I cannot believe that this is on broadcast television. The you mean with the visual image, gore of the, the blood the, and the, yeah, and the, the horror. Gore and the, it, it, but not just that, but if anything could be said to be shot lyrically, I felt like that Hannibal was shot in a very lyric way. It was beautiful, and obviously that has to do with the directors too, but that's also the producer's vision. Okay, so now after the double L's. Double L's. Get frustrated with you, Catfish, because I was about to explain my other point sh- breaker which knocked it down to eight points i will explain that the second thing that made me drop a point from this pilot episode okay was an idea that got admittedly into my head from certain television critics reviews and that is the lead character in this show the actor doesn't grab me he almost struggles with what should be a very simple part you just come out you're a tough guy you've got charisma and then you've got heartbreak that seems to me a, a wonderful actor that I am that that would be an easy thing to sell well and yet I, he know. does not captivate me we found out after the premiere and I did not know this that this actor is British he's well, not let's, American let's and be I, honest I, half of the Americans on American gods are British yeah, we brought them over British, to the new country we should be called them British American gods or expat as, gods. as an American actor not that I would be up for any of these parts you want it but it bothers me yeah. that we go and get British actors I know we have good actors here in America especially because the kid that they got uh, to play the god of technology he appears pl- in the end in the uh, it, kind of yeah. weird limo slash he had never technology done any, zone. He had never been on a set before, we found out from the Q&A. It was the first time he'd been on a film set. And, Clearly, and what, he was and what's an actor. His, what, and what's his character's name? What is, his, what is Mr. Technology's name? Yes, thank you. That book reader, I'm glad you <laughs> set you up with a softball there. Okay, <laughs> so look, let's get down and just go through it beat by beat. It opens, once again, it's throwing you into the world. It opens with a voiceover talking about what we would call the Norsemen, the Vikings, right. even though the Vikings were Danes, history majors. The Norsemen, and I don't think this is Leif Erikson, but the precursors to Leif no, Erikson. No, they said that Leif Erikson showed up 100 years later and kicked ass. Right. So these Norsemen coming to, quote-unquote, the New World, North America, and they bring their gods with them, but their gods don't seem to help them at all in this new land where they can be hit by Native Americans. Well, clearly the, Norse, the Norse gods believe in, and it's funny, too, because Anansi says the same thing that's going to be in episode two, because what happens is at the beginning of each episode will introduce sort of the history of a different god. Right. So both of these gods... Essentially, well, the Norsemen believe it. Anansi says it specifically. Now, Anansi, for you. anybody who has not read the book, who is Anansi, since he's not in this episode? He is the, uh, a god that the Africans believe in that is a spider god. Excellent. He appears in episode two. So Right, and that is played by Orlando Jones. Again, he was another one. They showed a clip. He's, oh, he was he great. he was amazing. The Norse god, the Norsemen believe... Our gods help those who help themselves. So they decide the first thing we need to do is sacrifice one of our eyes. Right. <laughs> that doesn't get the wind to blow. They're stuck in this new world. Yeah, and they- let me say, mm-hmm. if you're a new viewer and you can make it past this scene, you, you can go. Because this is a, you are thrown into this world, and you're thrown into a very violent world. I mean, the first thing that happens is a guy gets to enjoy about uh, 200 arrows into his body in a short amount of time. Although people might be, if you you watch this, you watch the beginning of this episode, yeah. and it's sort of a little bit of... A twist because in the sort of cartoonish violence and and copious amounts of blood splatter, it reminds me of another star series called Spartacus. But then there's nothing like that for the entire rest of the episode. And in fact, it was smart that they put some. It's smart that they put some action at the beginning because then it's slow for slow going for quite a bit of the while as we follow Shadow Moon leaving prison. 
We're where back at the, the beginning. Norsemen first blind themselves. They make themselves the one-eyed king, <laughs> and then they decide, oh, no, our god loves fighting right. more. So then they fight each other in a battle. Uh, where, we're not, not realizing that when they, when they finally row back home that they're going to— they're going to have to do twice the work because they end up killing half of each – half of the crew ends up dying and then the wind finally blows. Visually, the way they would show the wind blowing by the sand uh, pouring out of that bag, I, I thought that's your first clue to this being a very impressive visually show. You know, This is a, a trademark of Brian Fuller and, oh, man, was this crazy. So then we get to meet Harvest Moon. <laughs> Shadow Moon. Then we get to meet Shadow Moon. And he- it's explained that his mother it was a hippie. Sure, sure, sure. And so, of course, if you put the if you say the last name first, it's Moon Shadow. Ooh, I like that. Watch him be the Moon Child. They said it. Mister Wednesday said it to him on the plane. That's true. So this Mister Wednesday. So this feels like a typical kind of setup. To a TV show. Oh, it's a guy's getting out of prison. And then he gives, uh, you know, some kind of surreal imagery. He has a vision, a dream of his wife up on the ceiling of his prison cell saying, I love you. I love you, Shadow Moon, and all this stuff. And then, okay, the nice twist. Well, first, first you have to explain is he had a feeling. He kept saying, All right. I have a feeling like something bad's going to happen, like the weather needs to break, like something is building up. He keeps seeing up. a noose. You know, he's he's let out of prison, and he, he is struggling. He wants to fly home. He's got to be there at least for his wife's funeral. These are all kind of, I almost want to say tropes of certain types of films, of, uh, you know, the guy who gets out of prison and then is, is corrupted to go back to crime. And, that, and that's something I think viewers... Anybody might be familiar with, and then which he, is why I thought it was so it was smart for them to start with some action because because it was a trope. It was almost like all right, let's let's move on. Sure, he goes to the airport. He sees the right way to talk your way onto a flight early. And let me say that we are recording this now at the end of April 2017, where throughout the news of the last several weeks is many people having problems at airlines. So this boy, things are lining up for this show to really hit a cultural zeitgeist, huh? What I would like a little bit more in this show is a little bit of humor to leaven some of the stuff. And the moment where he flashes back to his friend in prison, giving him some advice while they're building birdhouses was great, where he was like, do not. He tells him this story about how a guy ended up back in jail because he messed with a, a one of the uh, airline personnel at the ticket counter. And he tells him a story about how the guy messed with this woman and then ended back in prison he's like oh i shadow moon says i understand what you're saying you, you you have to act differently when you get out of the world he said no 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 i'm saying do not mess with the women at the ticket counter so that was a <laughs> funny moment and i'd like to see more of those that's where he gets introduced to this man who introduces himself as mr wednesday a guy he who doesn't really he just says he says what's your name and he says well what day is it he says wednesday well yeah let's just say it's my day Obviously, we're clued into that. This man is not just an ordinary man. He knows things he shouldn't know. He seems to have, even early on, I don't want to say a, a true power so much as just uh, you know clairvoyance almost in some of the things he knows. Right, some but of the remember things he his can do. most important power. What's that? He can fall asleep anywhere <laughs> like that. Boom. Yeah, that's that's a gr- that's a great power. <laughs> People may get it listening to the, our podcast here on the WB Podcast <laughs> Network. We, we could also be giving that power to many listeners. This is Ian McShane. This is a man who is beloved in many countries all over the world for many different projects because he's been in entertainment so long here in America. I know him primarily strongest from his roles Al Swearingen on Deadwood. He is a national treasure. He was in Sexy Beast. And apparently, again, the Brit again. who plays Shadow Moon, yeah. who they're both from Manchester, as yeah. he said, and they love Manchester United. He, sa- he said he was great in Lovejoy, which I'd never heard of. I hadn't heard of it But looked up either. online and it has, it must have been a television series. It has 35 episodes or something, which is a lot of episodes for a, for a British show. Yeah. And so he's there. You are, I should say, I am as a viewer magnetically drawn to him. He can make mm-hmm. things interesting. He can play menace. He can, he can quit. He can do quips. He's really great. So it feels like at the very beginning, 
you know, maybe 20 minutes in, we're introduced to, okay, this is our team, this is our pair. And then at some point, I, I, it's tough without our notes to know exactly when it happens. But then at a certain point, we just cut to Los Angeles and we meet this new character. Uh, Belquist. Belquist. And she is seducing Bill Murray's younger brother, Joel. <laughs> and this scene... This is another one where if you can make wow. through this scene and the shock of it and the double V of it. The double V of it. The vagina vanishing that Joel Murray does. This lets you know, oh, snap, this is something, this is unique. That scene really, the payoff to it was incredible. As we see her, de- for lack of a better word, de-age, she starts looking better, more vitality in her as she has consumed this person who you rightly said she wants to to worship her and it's that belief that worshiping and possibly the whole soul that she sucks up suddenly she's uh loses a you know it's like she went to the spa and had a facial because she suddenly looks great yeah yes very adult content i have to say that is one of the sexiest scenes i have ever seen whoa on something and the fact that it turns from sexy to complete shock is I think a great great turn. Will you say complete shock for even though Joel Murray is an actor I recognize many people might recognize him from Mad Men. I knew he was going to die. There was there was no way that the the way the scene was set up. There was no way that this character was going to live. But it was the how. He yeah, well, went. that's what oh, I'm wow, saying. Wow, wow, yes, wow. exactly. You're like, can that? I didn't realize that fit in there. <laughs> <laughs> And so then we cut back. By this point, Shadow Moon has still not got, arrived at his destination. He went to a park, and that scene in the park, I think that's maybe supposed to make us feel his his pain and kind of suffering, you know, when he goes to the cliff and kind of screams. Ah. Well, there was, two th- there was two distinct beats there. One yeah. was he stops in a beautiful place, he closes his eyes, and he smells, and it's like freedom. So he's experiencing two things. He's experiencing freedom for the first time in a long time, and then he experiences other dominant emotion, which is loss. Right. Whoa. But maybe it's because the actor's uh, portrayal, once again, just didn't connect with me. That moment doesn't feel too strong. I liked him except for the scene in the cemetery where I felt like they – had written things for him to do that were either maybe difficult to do from the page or just a little bit difficult for him to do. I didn't really feel his brokenness. That's what I don't feel from him. I don't feel his brokenness. All right. Do you feel that's a, f- a fault of the acting, editing, directing, what, or it's just I, all uh, of the above? As he was doing it, I felt like mm, the words might be a little difficult, but... I believe I believe it was in the acting. Okay, so then so that's what I'm saying. That's the only part I get his like strong silent type thing. Yeah, but 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 I don't I don't feel his brokenness, and that's that's an acting thing. All right, so then we get to the bar. We are introduced. We all knew it was going to happen. We knew that Shadow Moon was going to work for Mister Wednesday. It is they push it off for a little bit, but you know it's going to happen. Right? There's the funny bit where you know Shadow Moon either has a trick coin or knows how to flip it because he's a flim flam man, and Mister Wednesday is able to turn that trick on its head. Yeah, and then someone who introduces himself. Did he call himself a leprechaun? I think he did. Didn't he? He did. He said, "I'm a leprechaun." Uh, comes because up because Shadow Moon says you're a little tall for a leprechaun. <laughs> right, right, right. This guy knows much better coin tricks, and it was very impressive, very fun. This character is played by Pablo Schre- Schreider. Is that how you pronounce yes. his last name? Yes. People may know him from The Wire. They may know him from Orange Is the New Black, where he played the parole officer, or not the parole officer, excuse me, the prison officer, Porn Stash. He's been in two great series. He's a now a about to start his third. Boy, this is this is a fun character. This is fun. Everybody likes a uh, saucy leprechaun. It is fun. And uh, again, another little bit from the Q&A we had. Obviously, when you say there's only one book, even though it's a big book, how are you going to expand this out? And when the producers went to go talk to Neil Gaiman, he said, you know, at the time I didn't really have the power to put out a book that that was 1,200 pages like I really wanted to put out. So apparently he had a lot of 
story for the other actors. And in fact, he had written a backstory going back 600 years for Mad Sweeney, uh, just separately from the other material that he wrote for the book. So they're incorporating, sounds to me like they admitted they're incorporating a lot from what Neil Gaiman told them as far as what was going on that was not captured in the book, but that he had either written down or had in mind. And then they added some of their own things. So you can trust that if you like Neil Gaiman, that there's going to be a lot of things that he wrote that will, that you haven't seen before that will be in this. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. Certainly. I should point out that in several of Shadow Moon's kind of visions, he goes to this land of, for lack of a better word, creepy trees, trees that might have kind of souls in them because the, tr- the branches kind of become hands and, the, and they reach out toward them. their skulls great on the ground. Great vision. Yeah, yeah, great, great vision. And so obviously Shadow Moon, who doesn't react outwardly is to the unbelievable things that are happening as one might in these situations, uh, he's found himself a bit of trouble. Right, so now he agrees or gets hornswoggled into working for Mr. Wednesday, but Mr. Wednesday says, "You, I will say this one time and one time only. Take all the time you need because to, it's 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 Shadow go, Moon's wife. Go funeral. to your wife's funeral, right? So the, he does go to the funeral, and that's where he finds out the unfortunate way in which his wife and best friend died. I guess if your wife and best friend have to die." It's good that they were enjoying their last moments together. <laughs> I would say that as soon as I saw the newspaper, which had a picture of both the wife and the best friend dying in a car crash, I could see this coming. It still didn't take away the power or what should be the pain for Shadow Moon from that scene. It's just, once again, you could see the writing on the wall, but it's still enjoyable. Shadow Moon finds out the truth about his wife's final moments from his, I guess his, his best friend's wife. They... Then go to the funeral, and there's a bit of a Twin Peaks moment as the casket has trouble going into the ground there. Right, right. Is it Laura Moon's funeral? And then we have the scene. Is this the scene you were talking about that just felt like it went on too long, where the the friend's wife tries to seduce Shadow Moon to get her revenge? Yes, exactly. And as I said before, I was a little concerned by, obviously— the actress, you know, the the character is said. Did she say she took a lot of Ativan? What did she take a lot <laughs> of? She said she took a lot of obviously depressants, so that would affect her. But I, I still was a little. It felt just a little over the top to me for the rest of the performances we were seeing. So we see the coin suck into the ground. One of the angry leprechaun's coins sucked into the ground, the fresh dirt there. Right, Laura the coin Moon's. that Shadow Moon presumably won by beating Mad Sweeney in the a fight that we didn't see the end of. True. And then a make sure I'm not jumping too far ahead, but then it feels like we come to the end section where Shadow Moon is walking back from the funeral uh, where to in particular, maybe he's just so depressed about this tragic turn his life has taken that he's walking off in, in, to get some space. The lights start turning off. The street lights stop, start turning off on the street he's walking. And then what maybe looks like fireflies, but certainly we know couldn't be fireflies, start all kind of forming in this little object on the ground. Shadow Moon goes up to it. It jumps on his face. And this is where I felt like, okay, if I hadn't read those pre-show reviews, I might have been able to roll with everything so far, but this to me, even though I, I guess I understood, okay, he's got to meet some new gods, this felt like the complete left turn. Like, whoa, wait, what is going on? Suddenly we're in an episode of Legion, and we meet, was it Mr. Technology? Technology Boy. Technology Boy, yeah. And uh, even though it was still enjoyable in that character, I loved his uh, curl of hair on his head. I tried to do that with my hair <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> you know, once again, we entered complete... Fantasy land. This is where Shadow Moon, if if he hasn't already, this is where he should be really freaking out and saying, what the blank is going on? The only excuse I'll give or rationale is that the a technology boy is, is uh, smoking the, uh, the psychedelic uh, toad skin <laughs> uh, pipe. I don't even know how to describe it. And so presumably Shadow Moon is affected by this as well. Again, I don't 
I don't mind him being stoic. I just feel like there's some other colors that are missing. That didn't bother me there, actually. The the stoic archetype is fine for me. All right, so let's let's just get through it. He's attacked by these faceless. I almost want to call them drones. These did they have a name? I'm sorry if I don't remember. I these, don't remember these. Uh, obviously, manifestations of this technology. Kings of power. I, I think they're technology boy interns. <laughs> TBIs. Yeah, and now you have to pay them. Thanks a lot, now, Trump. Now not hiring interns <laughs> for technology boy. <laughs> not only do they beat the living crud out of him, they also uh, string him up. Right. So there's a there's that rope that noose, Shadow yeah. Moon had seen before. And what's sort of a little bit interesting here is that this means something a little bit different than it would have if they had cast the character as ethnicity as it is in the book, which is not African-American. So, Oh, the, the, there, he's specifically not African-American in the book or he's just, I don't believe, I don't believe he's, is mentioned, but I think it probably would have been referenced if okay. he wasn't. No one says, Hey whitey, <laughs> but yeah. So this, this character, I don't believe is African-American. And then they leave us on a bizarre cliffhanger where he saved, where somebody cuts down that rope, somebody destroys those other things. Or shoots the rope or whatever. Right. You yeah. would assume, I would assume, as the newbie, that this is Mr. Wednesday coming to save his new right-hand man. But we'll see. Well, it, the question is, I think the question would okay. have to be for a viewer who hadn't read the book would be, now, where did that did that beating happen in the real world? There's hmm. there's a there mix. was so much blood there's on a, the ground. Yeah, this is a good but, question. But but there's there's a mix in this show, which is interesting. Which is, you know, you just mentioned Legion, and it's not as pr- pronounced as it was in Legion, which was one big uh, mind screw. There's some times where stuff seems real, and then it's not real. So, and, and since he put that on his head and was presumably. Or that he didn't put it on his head, but that object glommed onto his head. Right. Presumably, all that was happening was in his head. So did then the interns from the box get shipped out to right where he was and, and beat him up? I don't think so. I still think that all this with his, was in his head. That's what I think anyway. Okay. I didn't interpret it that way. I thought certainly the what I call the limo area was inside his head or is inside this vision of, or whatever. But I thought once he was outside of it and he was on like muddy soil and then strung up in the tree, I thought that – But all that, that could was be real. done in his head too. That's true. I, I just didn't interpret it that way in any way. So I, Let's talk about a few interesting things that we learned from the Q&A afterwards. Right. And so are the – so we'll, should we do that in a non-spoiler way and then – in a spoiler way or is there yeah let's uh, i'll i'll talk about there's a few things that are non-spoilery and really one thing that i think is spoilery okay so let's let's go through the the non-spoilery part of the panel which just for everybody playing along at home this panel featured the show runners the show creators that's brian fuller and michael green it also featured the actors who plays shadow moon Ricky Whittle. We had the actress who plays his wife, Emily Browning. We had Bruce Langley, who you pointed out uh, hadn't done anything before this as Technology Boy. Boy, I can now... Technical Boy. Technical Boy, excuse me. We had the actress, and I cannot pronounce any Yatidi of these. Yatidi Bataki. Boy, that is great. Who plays Bilquis. Yeah, she was there. Bob Lowe Schreiber was there. We had Crispin Glover, who plays a character who hasn't yet been introduced on the show, and, they, and uh, he'll be coming up. We also had... Orlando Jones. Orlando Jones, who wasn't in this episode, but is coming up on the show. And so this was a real treat but so many people on stage at one time we really didn't get to hear many answers from many of them and i will say this having been to uh, many of these events that was a much longer q a than we usually get usually you get a couple of questions and answers with the producers maybe three and then pretty much every single person on the panel kind of answers one question and it's kind of the way the game of thrones one we went to a few years ago was the same way. Right. So this was actually in depth. Everybody got to speak at least twice, except for Crispin Glover, who really only spoke once. And I have to say, this is non spoilery. He is a fascinating dude. He, there's something, you know, there's, I believe there's two ways 
two main ways you can get noticed as an actor or performer. And one is, is you just blast everything out there. You're full energy. It's kind of a Robin Williams kind of thing Mm -hmm. that's captivating. The other way you can be captivating to somebody is you're quiet. You're, you're kind of within yourself. And because of that, people are drawn in. They kind of lean forward. They have to like (laughs) focus. Okay. Because this person is giving so little, but he is so fascinating and the producers, Brian Fuller and Michael Green, told a great story how they met him at a restaurant. A coffee shop. I thought it was in Silver Lake. Right. And he shows up on his bicycle. He's wearing a velvet suit and a hat. Yeah. He gets off his bicycle, and when he goes to walk in, he takes his hat off as a gentleman would. That's exactly how Brian Fuller said it before he walked in to the restaurant. So they... Had they said they we they had to put that in to his entrance onto the show, right? Because the taking off of the hat was so amazing, and the clip that they showed of him, even though it was short, it was short, but he was intense. He was great. My God, he is, there's going to be such great performances on this show. And again, I do agree that the center of the show is not as strong as I would like it, uh, but the. Tangential performances are just amazing. Incredible. And so let's talk about just some other things they talked about in the panel. It turned out that only uh, – I'm going to mispronounce her name again. Yatiti – is that how you say it? Yatiti Badika. Yatiti Badika and Orlando Jones were the only ones of this panel who had – only actors on this panel who had read the novel – before they started doing the show. And that was interesting. But when they asked the audience who was watching it, they said, how many people in the audience have read the novel American Gods? It felt like 75% of the audience had read and it. I'll it was t- a lot of hands I'll, went up. I will, I will tell you why that is. Because, again, because it's Emmy season, there are like five events a week for – like a month and a half, two months solid. Mm-hmm. You could go. You could go see something five days a week. So there's a little bit of fatigue. So because it's a show that hasn't aired yet, so people can't get excited about it, and also because it skews a little bit younger than I think a lot of Academy members are. Okay, that the people who were showing up were showing up because they love the the intellectual property American Gods. Right. So that makes more sense now. Orlando Jones told a great story how he was was desperate to do this. That in fact, uh, years ago, he tweeted out that he wanted to be that he wanted to be a character on this show. And sure no, enough, no, he wanted that he specifically wanted to be Mr. Nancy. In fact, he in a tweet he had sent a picture of him dressed as Mr. Nancy, pointed to a sign that said Mr. Nancy. Yeah, and didn't he tweet that towards or Neil Gaiman saw it somehow? Neil right? Gaiman saw it, started following him, and so. You know they probably probably got word to the to the producers. And again, this is a spoiler because if you don't know that Orlando Jones is in it, but he opens up episode two with an amazing performance, amazing yeah monologue that he gets to deliver, and he is just great. If people know him as kind of his comedic persona as, as he is in so many of his parts, this guy is is great in this. It's almost eye opening about right, how good see, he is. Th- and this. this is why I think that. Comic actors can do dramatic performances because I think to have a, a a really strong character, you need a kind of sense of timing and pace and 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 deliciousness and fun that is missing from some performances, maybe even in the show. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so Catfish, any other non-spoilery points that you wanted to make from this wonderful panel we got to watch? Yes, one other. They did, in fact, say, and I. I think they said that stars recommended it that because they're showing some nudity in the show, they're doing equal opportunity nudity. So for those of you out there who are tired of seeing breasts, uh, there is going to be hashtag more schlong in this show. Yeah, but uh, if you're tired of seeing breasts, I think you will definitely see breasts is in addition to the breasts we saw in this you, I- episode. Pro- you will, but I'm saying – You'll for for somehow you, it'll be balanced for out. anybody who is tired of of seeing of only breasts. seeing only breasts. Okay, that's grammatically. You'll correct. be able to see some. And in fact, they they were talking to an actor who they were going to do nudity, and he said, "Okay, I'll do it under a couple conditions." I can't remember the first one, but the second one was he said, "Give me a beautiful schlong." 
and apparently it's digitally enhanced and beautiful is what they imply i w- what it either implied to me was that either they used a body double or they used a prosthesis but or both so they definitely i don't think it was digitally enhanced i think they gave him oh, a I don't know. a rubber cock okay. yeah they built a lifelike rubber cock that they put over his all right. Uh, in a couple episodes, theoretically, we'll all see this, and okay. we'll be able to. You're, you'll decide, right? Well, <laughs> you'll decide CGI or rubber. <laughs> so, okay, for everybody who's interested in this, we love conversation. Go to our Facebook page, facebook.com/slash Double P Podcast. Tell us your thoughts now that you've seen the American Gods premiere. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Were you new to the books like me, Bubba? Were you a book lover like Catfish? We want to know. You can also reach us via Twitter. My name is Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F-I-T-T-E-N-T-R-I-M at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And I'm Catfish. You can hit me up at CJGman67. Now, for everybody who has either read ahead on the books or doesn't mind spoilers, we're going to go into a spoiler section. For everybody else, we'll see you on our next podcast But for people who don't mind spoilers or read the books, we're going to get into some spoiler sections right now. And we're just going to continue where we were with maybe spoilers that popped up in the after show panel. Mm -hmm. Catfish, what were any spoiler things that popped up in the after show panel that struck you? Well, this one is going to be an extra double spoiler. Oh, yeah. This is for people who have read the book Uh but don't know much about the show Mm -hmm. and don't want to be spoiled about something new in the show that's not in the books. So if even if you're a book reader, there's something new. So if you don't want to know about it, turn your avert your eyes and ears in three, two, one. Okay, so they for the show created a new American god. Yeah. And that god is called Vulcan, apparently, played by Corbin Burnson. And the idea is that he is the god of guns, that American loves guns. And the idea that Vulcan is the god of volcano and that kind of like a gun is is like an explosive volcano in your hand. So uh, I think that's a smart one. I, you know, I remember someone tweeted – at, at us recently about I, I, I think it might have even been Patman23, our dearest and oldest friend. Oh yeah. I, I, sorry, not oldest, our oldest listener. Let's say that. What uh, about Iron Drone? But anyway, because okay, I continue. Yeah, sorry, continue. sorry. That he hoped that they would t- that there were some things in the book that seemed sort of British that in other words that, that were, kind of didn't seem American and it was just an interpretation because Neil Gaiman is not an American and he hoped that those would be ironed out. And I said, I'm sure that they will remove uh, the uh, Britishisms from her to smooth those over because it's all Americans involved with the production. Although, again, it's filthy with Brits in the cast. <laughs> um, and I thought that they would, you know, add – I thought said I thought they'd add to that. And they have indeed. So they've added a new American god. I think it will be smart. They are taking one book, and they are hopeful to get five seasons out of it, presumably presumably at least five. And, and yeah, Catfish, and just to piggyback on what you're saying, now I haven't read the book, you have, but the cast was talking about having seen the last episode of this season recently, and they all let it slip that a big chunk, and maybe all of the season finale of this season, is it's not, a, in, the book is not in the book at all. It's and so not in that's the book exciting. At all. That is exciting. Obviously, when you have a when you have one book, it has one denouement. And when you're making five seasons of a TV show, you need to have five denouements, right? Or you know, four mini denouements. So the other thing they said was that this this basically covered a third of the book. Wow! So there's no way if they had their druthers that they would do three seasons and out. Well, maybe they they didn't really actually name their. But a finite goal for seasons. They just right. at this point they were just talking about we're we're excited to get back with this cast and do season two. Right. But I would feel comfortable as someone who enjoyed the book, knowing that a lot of what they added was stuff that Neil Gaiman not only had thought about now, but had written and thought about at the time and just didn't have room to put it in the book. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Any other spoilers you want to get to? Do you want to talk about these scenes we saw from upcoming episodes that theoretically were in the book 
Were they, were they in the book? Because they, they were really fun. So we mentioned it earlier. There's a scene in the beginning of the next episode that introduces Orlando Jones' character, and it takes place on a slave ship. Yes. And it is, it is powerful, and it's about this god, Mr. Nancy, is it? Sorry, I'm going to mispronounce it a bit. Yes. Where he is pretty much able to see the future, and he lays out the next several hundred years for these uh, poor in- slaves who and their ancestors' history, and he encourages them to uprise and burn the ship and, and just, you know, make a strike. And it was a powerful scene. It's amazing. I think that if that dialogue had been spoken by someone that wouldn't wasn't so amazing, you would be so maybe a little bit of gape of like, how is he able to tell us all these amazing things that it's kind of like kind of shoehorning uh, some social commentary. Oh, in. yeah. Uh, but he does an amazing job, Orlando Jones. Was was that in the book that, or that uh, some similar to that? Yes. Yes. They, they, we get an introduction to all these gods. Excellent. We also saw a scene from the fourth episode where it turns out, spoiler alert, the wife Shadow Moon's wife is back, probably from that special coin, and she's having a intimate uh, bathroom discussion with her best friend, who she ch- cheated, who she fooled around with her best friend's husband, and, and the, they're airing out their differences. Is a nice way to say it. The other thing they mentioned as well is that she has a lot of interactions with Mad Sweeney throughout this. Yeah, and they implied those aren't from the books either. Yes, not f- my memory of the book is that the only person that she appears to is her husband, Shadow Moon. Right. That is the only person she appears no, they, to. The actors and, I believe, even the producers implied this is going to be Bonnie and Clyde type story with yeah. a zombie, a.k.a. Laura Moon, and a leprechaun, a.k.a. Hey, Mad Sweeney. Yeah, and so that seems to be a, a storyline that we're going to have coming up, and the spoiler alert on that, but it... You like those two characters, presumably, so that should be fun to see, especially anything more with uh, the leprechaun. Let's roll. I'm good. And the scene uh, also has a bit of comedy in it, in that for various reasons, Laura Moon is uh, she's on the toilet because she's getting rid of her embalming fluid. That's only there's no other nice way to say it. Whoa. Yeah, it, it's it, again, we sort of joined that one mid scene, so they explained it afterwards, and I was like, Ugh, we. And the same thing happens in the novel, too, and I don't know whether you got it or not, but it's, and they make it pretty clear, it's the coin that Shadow Moon throws on the grave that activates his wife to whatever she is ghost, vision, resuscitated british right right so again when they got to the woman who plays shadow moon's wife dead wife resuscitated wife was there too so since she had such a small bit in the pilot they showed a scene of her a future scene of hers before they asked her a question and what was amazing was the woman who she's doing the scene with is shadow moon's best friend's widow and in that scene, the widow stole that scene from the woman who was at the panel. She was amazing in that scene. You, from the, we should point out it's the actress Emily Browning okay, who thank plays you. Shadow Moon. She wife, was Laura. amazing in that scene. And after it was over, I'm like, why did they show that scene for to highlight Shadow Moon's wife when the other woman completely steals the scene and is amazing? You keep saying other woman. So as the person who's read every game of books, that character's name is? You gave this L- a Laura nine Moon. out of nine. No, <laughs> yes, her friend is named best friend's wife. Oh my goodness gracious! If I could, if I could binge watch the rest of oh, this yeah. show, would you not? I would do it. I would do it it's in a cool. second. Oh, so yeah. good. Yeah, it's shot beautifully. The performances that we saw, especially from Orlando Jones, uh, the little bit we saw from Crispin Glover, I'm super excited uh, to see. Media, Gillian Anderson portraying right. so, a bunch of so, different. So we know, spoiler alert, two of the pop 
figures, the you know entertainment uh, super idols that she's going to be appearing as. She's going to be appearing as Marilyn Monroe in one scene, right? And David Bowie in another scene. So good, Gillian Anderson. You know she's a great actress. She will eat this up. This is going to be exciting. Yeah, yeah. I I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it for the ancillary performances. All right. So now, does it bot? So sorry. Are you so you're along for the ride. Mostly for what? Not not the story at this point, right? It's per, for the performances. It seems. What would you say? Definitely the performances. Definitely the kind of movement it has, and the beauty of a Brian Fuller show. You know, this is just beautiful to watch. And also, if it's not a plot I can truly understand now, without you know some of my prior knowledge from reading reviews, it definitely seems like a world that you want to hang out in because it'll shock you. It'll thrill you. It'll, it'll make you laugh. You know, it has everything I think many people want out of a TV show. And, and I, that's what I felt. And so if I don't see a true through narrative without reading the reviews of, okay, old gods versus new, uh, you know, I still think I would be in because, hey, it's kind of a fun ride. That's my well, thought. Even though there are a lot of characters, this is not a Game of Thrones situation where everybody's in furs and there's all these different <laughs> factions and it's confusing. There's not there's, yet. It could be right, but there's essentially two factions in this show, right? And it's going to be very clear who's in what faction. So, buckle up. So, uh, it's going to be fascinating, but I don't think it'll be anywhere near as disorienting as. Game of Thrones was for people who didn't know for the books or for uh, viewers of Legion this year. Right. That played so much with reality that I never knew what the heck was going on. Right. Now, listeners, double L's. Yeah, double L's. Loyal <laughs> listeners. We, oh, it's late have, at night here. It's, what, I, 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 it's, a, it's an excuse that I didn't remember at the no, beginning because no, yeah, you no. haven't had me on a podcast That's for fine. so long. But it's only been like 30 minutes since you reminded me. So, Double L's, we're going to actually play some sections that we recorded earlier where we kind of talk more about spoiler things and spoiler subjects that we edited out of our earlier discussion and moved here to the end. And we're also going to uh, present you with a quiz where the spoiler section is a real spoiler section because Catfish spoils me on something, which he claims I should have known and every v- listener and viewer should know. And so we want you to listen to that and then vote. And we'll be back, <laughs> and we'll be back at the end for just one final wrap-up. Double, 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 double P podcast. Double P. What I like to call Shadow Moon leaving prison, finding out the information, you know, meeting Odin. Who's it? Wait, who is Odin? Odin. It's Odin's day is Wednesday. Okay, that's a spoiler alert. Uh, we're going to have to put a lot of, <laughs> oh my God. Yes, it is. It. You just freaking, oh my God. Mr. You just Wednesday. spoiled who Mr. Wednesday, Wednesday is. Wednesday is Odin's day. Everyone knows Wednesday is No Odin's one knows day. that. No you one. You know just Wednesday spoiled the friggin' day? show for me and for every newbie. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you can cut that out. I am you cutting can... that out. Oh, Jesus Christ. Or I'll put this at the end. Well, I'll put a spoiler <laughs> alert. And then, okay, so if you're listening to this spo- right now, this appeared in the middle in the middle episode with Catfish was spoiling a Gillian Anderson, really. Crispin Glover. Yes, it is. It's a spoiler. No one would no, know. You don't know that. Why doesn't Odin? he just come out and say, I'm Odin? He says, Wednesday, he says, this is my day. Mr. Wednesday. Oh, my God. It's a Wednesday. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're just. Uh, All right, fine. People, let's let's find out. Hold on. So if you're listening to this in the spoiler section. You, <laughs> then you already know, and so you agree no, no, with no, me. no, or you don't care about spoilers. Okay. Did Catfish just spoil this for me? And if I had left it in the meat of the podcast, everybody, do you think that well, they all of everybody? You. Do you think that everybody knows that Odin is Wednesday? Write to us on our Facebook page, Facebook dot com slash double p podcast. That's the word double, the single letter p, the word podcast plural. Facebook dot com slash double p podcast. We want to know isn't what Catfish it, just really? say. Did he just freaking want to spoil everybody? This is, you know what? This is a shout out to Terrible Tia. Terrible Tia, you ain't got nothing. You got, you got nothing <laughs> well, on Double C. I'm so confused because I, I don't feel like he, knowing that he's Odin is a big is a big spoiler. Who no. cares who he oh, is? Oh, Jesus. Clearly- 
Fucking Christ, the show is keeping that a secret. Literally, you read reviews and it says, well, I read the book, so I know who Mr. Wednesday really is. The main character, Shadow Moon, doesn't know who he is. Oh, this is your fault because you're always. This is your fault because you are trying to make me identify names. So I wanted to be very particular (laughs) and say that it was Odin. I have once again. I I feel free predicting because I don't know what's going to happen. But is it perhaps that once Shadow Moon, maybe at the end of this book slash series, we're going to find out, oh, that when Shadow Moon, who's about to be let out of prison, found out that his wife day died, he hung himself. And all of this is kind of like a, a post-death uh, apocalypse. Now, that might be <laughs> that true. Is, that it, is it, not going to happen no matter what. It was all a dream. That No, that is based on a, a, the, a very uh, famous Twilight Zone, which was based on a short story. Where a uh, Confederate soldier, uh, no, actually, I believe it's a rebel soldier. Uh, right. Yes, that's a very yes. The it's a, the the Owl, the incident at Owl Creek Owl, Bridge. Incident at Owl Creek Bridge. Right. right. Where so he like, thinks well, he's getting home. But fair enough. Okay. So now you're telling me my predictions won't come true. This is the I'm just most saying, fun I'm just saying, idea. I'm just saying maybe you can do a movie where at the end it was all a dream or something. That I'm happened, not saying it's all a dream. Maybe like he's three... dead. Maybe he's dead. But of course you're going to spoil me and tell me that's not true either. This is. Spoiler filled podcast, everybody. So then it but turns mostly out. For you. Oh my God. Oh my God. Double <laughs> So that's our breakdown of American Gods, episode one, season one, the premiere. This is really great. This is the type of show that is so good and, and pulls you in so much that this is the type of show that if maybe we get enough feedback on, it, we could do as its own podcast because it's really, really fun. It's funny because I was going to say that. This show feels, you know, they don't know whether they've been picked up for the second season. They're hopeful. But this show feels very on brand for stars. Mm -hmm. It has, it's sort of a strange, unholy mix, as I said, of Spartacus and Ash versus the Evil Dead. It feels very on brand for them. Oh, yeah. And it feels very on brand for the Double P podcast. Yeah. So if you guys want us to pick this up and do this as a weekly show, or at least a show where we cover every single episode in a podcast with our typical brand of Double P podcast nonsense, let us know. You can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Double P podcast, plural. Boy, I never say podcast. I'm bad that way. Or you can hit us up on Twitter. One last reminder. My name is Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F-I-T-T-E-N-T-R-I-M at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And I am Catfish. You can hit me up at CJGman67. For the unbook reader gods, I'm Bubba signing off. And I'm Mr. Wednesday. Son of a bitch. <laughs> again, again, another little, again, and again, it's, and, and again, as I said before, as I said before, as I said before, as I said before, as I said before.